Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about power. We're going to be like Jeremy Clarkson in every episode of Top Gear. It's all about speed and power. Now, when it comes to aircraft, both of these things are sought after in a great deal of designs, particularly the offensive ones. Having a super fast plane that packs a real wallop. That's basically how you can describe the historical progression and goals of a great deal of military aircraft. On a lot of aircraft, old and new, speed and power using piston engines, early jet engines, or modern jet engines to make fighters faster, bombers carry more, interceptors climb faster, etc. That was the name of the game. As should be no real surprise though, this push for greater speed and power came with a great deal of issues and kinks that needed to be worked out. So many aircraft that flew these new super powerful engines experienced initial problems in that the engines just weren't putting out the power that was expected, or the engines just didn't work right, so they had to go back to the drawing board and rework things, which in turn delayed the plane that was to use that new engine. Advancing technology can be quite the hassle. For today's subject, though, the problem was less that the new engines and or engine systems they were using didn't put out enough power, but more that they kind of put out too much power in a sense, which caused the plane that they were on to not only have significant delays in testing and eventual production, but to end up with a horrid reputation of constantly catching on fire out of nowhere. This is the plane that German airmen referred to as the Reich's Leiter. This is the Heinkel HE-177 Grief, or Gref. And what an apt name. I'm sure that the plane did cause quite a lot of grief for German pilots. To start out, though, we first have to talk about German bomber philosophy. We can kind of divide bombers, more traditional level bombers, into four categories light, medium, heavy, and schnell. And admittedly, there is a good deal of overlap between light and schnell, but I digress. Between the first three, the major differences between them are aircraft size and payload. Light bombers had very small payloads, but because of that, they were faster and therefore a bit more capable in a fight. Heavy bombers, on the other hand, were twin engine at minimum, four to six engine likely, massive aircraft with massive payloads that could absolutely devastate any battleground. But with its sheer size, it was also quite slow and thus a massive target. Medium bombers, of course, are a happy medium between the two. For the German military in the lead-up to World War II, they largely settled around the idea of the Schnell bomber, which would be a light to medium bomber that prioritized speed above all else, leaving both payload and defensive armament light to increase that speed. At most, the majority of German military leadership would go up to a medium bomber but the concept of a heavy bomber was effectively out of the question. The heavy bombers, slow, lumbering, massive, but with incredible payloads, were viewed as being pointless in German military strategy. After all, Germany would strongly utilize the Blitzkrieg strategy that saw the use of swift, sudden, strong blows that would knock the enemy off balance and pierce their defensive lines. Such a large, sluggish plane just didn't fit into that strategy. So early leaders like Ernst Udet and Erhard Milch favored lighter Schnell bombers and faster medium bombers at most. Still, even though this was the majority opinion in the German military, some did go against the grain and would argue for the inclusion of heavy bombers. One such man was General Walther Weber, who openly and strongly advocated for the Luftwaffe to build and field a long-range strategic heavy bomber that could penetrate deep into either British or Russian airspace and bomb vital infrastructure and resources. 
While his colleagues did not share in his enthusiasm, the general concept was given a bit of consideration in the so-called Ural Bomber program of the early to mid-1930s, named after the Ural region of Russia, and two heavy bomber designs would be accepted for prototype construction, the Dornier DO-19 and the Junkers Ju-89. However, German military leadership quickly soured on the designs after testing on them showed speeds that would struggle to hit even 200 miles an hour. Granted, the engines that were on the planes were still quite underpowered, and thus higher speeds on them weren't really viable, but regardless, leadership was not happy, and by April 1937, the project would be cancelled. Luckily for Weber, though, although he wouldn't actually be alive to see this after his death on June 3, 1936, due to a plane crash, that very day, the Reich Air Ministry unveiled requirements for the Bomber A project. Already seeing that the Eurobomber designs were slow and lumbering, the Bomber A project would ideally combine heavy bombers with Schnell bombers, to create something that the Blitzkrieg enthusiasts, we'll call them, would actually like. This project called for, at minimum, a payload of 2,650 pounds, a minimum range of 3,107 miles, and a top speed upwards of 310 miles an hour at an altitude of 19,500 feet. Other than these things, the rest of the design was left up to the discretion of the companies and their designers. The plane could be two, four, six, eight engines, whatever they really wanted. To these specifications, the company Heinkel came up with their P-1041 design, which was quickly accepted for a mock-up and prototype, in the process being given the designation of HE-177. Their design was a little bit different than one would typically assume for a long-range heavy bomber, in that at first glance, the HE-177 only had two engines, one engine nacelle on each wing. According to Heinkel, their design would have an estimated gross weight of 59,520 pounds and a top speed at altitude of around 342 miles an hour something that would have been incredibly impressive for 1937-38, especially for a twin-engine aircraft at such a size. The problem at this point was that no German engine had enough horsepower to achieve such a speed with such a weight, so Heinkel decided to improvise a little bit to max out horsepower per engine nacelle. One of the best engines they had at their disposal at this time was the Daimler-Benz DB601, but that engine only had about 1,000 to 1,300 horsepower, so to increase the engine power while not adding more engine nacelles, that would increase drag and reduce overall performance, two DB601 engines would be coupled together to run as a single unit. These more slapdash engines, named the DB606, would produce nearly 2,700 horsepower apiece, a monstrous boost over just about anything else Germany had in their arsenal, to further reduce weight and better the overall aerodynamics of the 177, the DB606 engines would not have typical radiators for cooling, but rather more experimental not used in military aircraft, evaporative cooling systems, where the wing surfaces would be used for the cooling. These worked on smaller racing planes that weren't subject to enemy fire, but on massive, high-powered war machines, using these was a major unknown. But if they worked, it could help significantly reduce drag and overall wind resistance, so it was a worthwhile risk, for a Schnellbomber-esque plane. Unfortunately for them, though, before the first prototype would be constructed, and before the design was actually even finalized, tests of the evaporative cooling system on single-engine aircraft, 
like the HE-100 and HE-119, led the designers to conclude in early 1939 that such a system for how much heat the DB-606 engines would be putting out was simply not feasible. This admission meant that a small cascade of design changes would occur to maintain plane performance. The addition of larger radiators would reduce speed and range, so extra fuel tanks had to be added into the wings to increase the range, which then increased the weight and decreased the structural strength of the wings. So some added reinforcement was added into the wings, which further reduced the hypothetical top speed. With this small change in engine cooling, the idea of a 342 mile an hour top speed was rapidly fading away. Further complicating matters for Heinkel designers was a request from the German Air Ministry that the HE-177, a heavy bomber, need I remind you, be capable of dive bombing. This meant that the frame and wings would need to be reinforced even further, so the massive 50,000 plus pound plane didn't tear itself apart mid-flight, and some dive brakes would have to be installed as well. Furthermore, a year prior in 1938, the Reich Air Ministry requested that the range be improved from around 3,000 miles to around 4,000 miles. With these early additions and requests, the gross weight shot up from around an estimated 59,000 pounds, upwards of over 63,000 pounds, perhaps even up to 68,000 pounds. All of these additions with no change to the engine power would certainly drop that estimated top speed considerably. Then, on November 9, 1939, the first HE-177 prototype, the V-1, would take to the air for its maiden voyage. The initial prototype, measuring in at 20 and a half meters long, 31.44 meters wide, and 6.67 meters tall, was actually quite a bit lighter than the estimated weight, sitting at just around 52,000 pounds, although its armament, both offensive and defensive, was not fully installed and a lot was missing. While I am curious as to what speed they managed to hit, no speed is listed for the V1, and presumably no top speed was ever actually achieved, as the flight had to be cut short. After about 12 or so minutes in the air, the engine started overheating to an alarming level, so the plane had to be landed for safety reasons. The overall results of these first test flights or that the plane handled relatively well, although the forces on the rudders were a bit high, and that there were some vibration issues and the tail surfaces were believed to be a bit small. For a while, the relative success of the V-1 flight, apart from the overheating and vibrating and all that, that would actually be a high point for the HE-177 as the next several prototypes would suffer major issues that had catastrophic consequences, often deadly ones. I should also note here real quick that some sources mix up which prototypes had which issue, so I'm going to try and parse these out the best I can. Both the V2 and V3 models would take to the air in early 1940 with some minor proposed adjustments. The V2 would largely be the same as the V1, but it was intended to alter the tail surfaces of both it and the V1, making them larger, and the V3 would have an improved gear system for the tail rudders and elevators to help reduce those vibration issues. The V3 would end up being the first one to go to that great runway in the sky in April 1940 after the trim or trimming something that is mainly used to help a plane stay level without pilot input, just didn't do that, and the plane crashed, killing the crew. The V-2 lasted a little bit longer, but in June 1940, it would join the V-3 in plane heaven. In a dive test for the dive-bombing heavy bomber, the plane began to have significant flutter issues, 
meaning that vibrations would compound and exacerbate each other, and the V-2 just ripped itself apart mid-air, killing several crew members. After this, the later prototypes would have the enlarged tail surfaces to try and prevent this from happening again. The V-4 would suffer a similar fate flying over the Baltic Sea, after the pilot failed to pull out of a dive and crashed, again killing the crew. The failure point this time was a gear in the propeller system. Then the V-5 would suffer a fate that many AHE-177 would later experience. During a low-altitude flight test, simulating a low-level ground attack, both engine nacelles suddenly burst into flames, which caused the V-5 to crash land and explode, going out in a fiery blaze of glory. Luckily though, after this, for the Luftwaffe, subsequent prototypes, the V-6, V-7, and V-8, all managed to survive mostly intact. The V-8 did have a lot of damage after it crashed on the runway after hitting a parked plane. But on the V-6, we actually have some top speed statistics. Did the V-6 actually manage to hit 342 miles an hour as originally planned? Plus, the V-6 had slightly improved engines, so maybe it was even better. Well, the top speed was a blazing 289 miles an hour, nearly 60 miles an hour slower than originally anticipated. Likely a massive disappointment to the Luftwaffe. And yet, despite the relatively disappointing speed and numerous issues that left several test pilots dead, the HE-177 advanced into pre-production aircraft, these called the A-0 series. This small series, numbering just 35 in total, gave us a first look at what the production model 177s would look like. These models had a better top speed, but only just barely at 298 miles an hour it would be able to hold upwards of 5,290 pounds of explosives and for its defensive armament, while this would change several times over on different models, the initial A-0 would have one forward-facing 7.9mm machine gun, a 20mm cannon in the front ventral, two 7.9mm machine guns in the rear ventral, and two 13mm guns in the dorsal and tail positions. When the first two A-0 models began their flight testing in late 1941 and early 1942, a similar problem would rear its ugly head. On both models, their testing would be cut short due to engine fires. The first model suffered the fires on takeoff, so it was a less catastrophic failure, but the second model suffered them mid-flight, forcing the crew to bail out and for the plane to be lost. So what was going on with the 177? Why was it just about constantly lighting on fire now? What about the design caused this? Well, in their quest for speed and power, bolting two engines together to create a single unit, along with making the engine nacelles rather snug, to reduce drag created a lot of compounding problems. For one, because the nacelle was cramped, this made routine maintenance much more difficult, which meant that such maintenance and routine cleaning was often skimped on. Further compounding issues with these snug nacelles was because they were so snug, everything necessary to engine function was so closely packed together much more so than on most other aircraft, and making things even worse, there was no firewall or heat shielding to help contain the heat to the engine block. This created a recipe for disaster when there were fuel or oil leaks, which, considering the more slapdash nature of the twin engines, were rather prone to occurring. The oil pump, for example, was too large, and at high altitudes, this led to the oil foaming and not making it into the engine, which led to a lack of lubrication in the engine block, which led to the engines cracking and breaking down. 
fuel and oil leaks would often leak onto the engine exhausts that were piping hot, leading to the oil combusting, with the nacelles also in all likelihood having excess old fuel and oil just sitting around in it, not being cleaned out like it probably should have been, when there was a spark, the fire became all the larger. This fire issue would present itself not only on the 35A0 models, but on later 130A1 models as well. It wouldn't be until the A3 models that something would be done about the engines bursting into flames. The engine nacelle would be lengthened by about 8 inches, a small amount to be sure, but enough to give them a little bit of wiggle room, space things out, and add some heat protection. And the exhaust system would be altered as well, to reduce the chance that oil would leak onto it. This minor change also necessitated a lengthening of the fuselage by 1.6 meters to counterbalance the slight shift in weight and center of gravity. These alterations did help with the engine fire issues, but didn't really solve the broader issue of the engines just overheating all the time. For example, with earlier A0 and A1 models that entered limited service in mid-1942 in Russia, many were lost with engine catching fires mid-flight, no enemy contact necessary. With early use of the A3 in late 1943, early 1944, the catching on fire issue didn't present itself nearly as much, but overheating still caused a good deal of planes to have to return before finishing their missions. Even then, with their limited use in Russia take away the technical issues, the 177 wasn't all that good anyway. They tried using them as cargo and transport aircraft, but their relatively limited cargo space, as far as heavy bombers are concerned, made them rather mediocre when compared to smaller, more reliable aircraft. On later A3 models and the next variant, the A5, the DB606 engines would be swapped out for new and improved DB610s, which were effectively two DB605 engines just bolted together. These engines would have around 3,100 horsepower apiece, a 400 horsepower boost over the 606. Additionally, with the late A3 models and the A5, an investigation into the constant engine fires in early 1943 led to a conclusion that at least 56 different things could be the cause of the fires, and all of them should be fixed. While they would be mostly remedied on late A3 and the A5 models, a good deal of the older models just wouldn't be fixed, due to it being too time-consuming. So, if those planes caught on fire, the pilots just had to deal with it, I guess. It sucks for them. But with the A5 models numbering some 350 strong, the improved engines and reduced problems in those engines, the final performance marks would sit with a top speed of 303 miles an hour at altitude, with a maximum bomb load of 13,200 pounds, a range of 3,700 miles, and a gross weight upwards of 68,000 to 70,000 pounds. Compare that to the original requirements set back in the late 30s, the top speed was not reached, but the maxed bomb load was just about quintupled, and it did meet the range, so the 177 also had that going for it. Now, out in the field, the A0s, A1s, A3s, and A5s, if we were to rate their success on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best, they would probably get a 2.5, maybe a 3. Its first use as a cargo and transport plane largely failed, as previously stated. Then, in mid to late 1943, a small group of 177s were used for anti-shipping combat in the Atlantic, to take out British shipping and war vessels. Unfortunately for them, at this point, a combination of frequent poor weather, allied defensive measures, and the general faultiness of the design led to little success in that area. 
Several more 177s burst into flames and were lost, and while they did score a few hits, there was rather little success in the grand scheme of things. In the second bombing run of Britain in Operation Steinbach, the 177s were used there, and surprisingly did have a bit more success than your average German bomber. Flying at over 20,000 feet, with over 6,000 pounds of explosives, the high altitude they flew at made it difficult for British interceptors to target and destroy them. Largely because of this height advantage, along with a tactical strategy of returning to base in a constant shallow dive that increased speed significantly, the 177s over Britain were able to drop their payloads and safely return to base quite often. Now, how much damage they actually did is up for debate, and Operation Steinbach was largely a failure, but the planes were surviving, so they were doing better than before. Similarly, later on in Russia in early to mid-1944, against the now-advancing Soviet Army, the 177s were able to have some success flying high-altitude bombing missions. Soviet aircraft typically hung low to the ground, so they either physically couldn't attack the 177s or just chose not to out of the hassle of it. This again gave the 177s a rather high survival rate, and they were able to drop their payloads, but again, how much damage they actually did is kind of not known. After that run of relative success and survivability, at least as far as the 177 is concerned, just about every one of them would be grounded, and production of new models would be ceased. At this stage of the war, mid to late 1944, with the Soviets advancing, and Allied fronts to the west and south, Germany was in a real bind, and was under constant attack. Most critically, their supply lines were under heavy assault, and as a result, aircraft fuel production was at catastrophically low levels. Because of this, fuel needed to be saved, and any aircraft not absolutely necessary to halting the advances or winning the war were grounded, which meant that the 177 was on the chopping block. Production and use was ordered to cease. Total production of the 177 numbered 1,135 aircraft, across all variants, pre-productions, and prototypes. Something else that should be mentioned, though, is that for most of the 177's career, a great deal of the aircraft made were just stuck on the ground, as procurement of the DB-606 and DB-610 engines was a major challenge. Resources were limited, and available engines would often go to more proven and effective models, like the BF-109 fighter and the BF-110 heavy fighter. This means that the 1,000-plus production run is a little bit misleading, as a good deal of those planes likely were not functional and never even got off the ground in the first place. As one final point, I want to quickly talk about Eric Brown, a British pilot who flew nearly 500 different aircraft, one of which was the 177 in 1944, after Britain managed to capture one and flew it back to home for testing and research. When Brown flew the 177, he noted that the controls felt remarkably light, almost too light for such a large aircraft and he had knowledge that there had been reports of the plane breaking apart mid-flight, so he was afraid to go too hard with the controls and push the plane to its limits. He also noted that on landing, the plane would suddenly jerk around considerably, so much so that he thought he actually damaged it just landing normally. Later on, he participated in an interview slash interrogation of Ernst Heinkel and asked him about the 177, and Heinkel himself seemed none too pleased about how the plane turned out. He would blame Ernst Udet and his love of dive bombing for what ended up happening to the 177. Brown, for his part, seemed to basically agree with Heinkel, saying that he instinctively felt that the 177 was unreliable 
and that it was one of the few German aircraft that he flew that he didn't like. Both through internal testing in Germany, wartime experiences, and through the third-party tests and examination by Eric Brown, the HE-177 was an objective failure, or the dream of bringing such speed and power to a heavy bomber went down quite literally in flames. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. There's a lot of reading to be done on the 177, and if you want some, I'll link some archive links down in the description. The annoying thing to me about them, though, is that the general picture of each of them is the same, but more specific details seem to differ a little bit in each of them. I would have to assume that that might be an effect of a lot of German documents getting destroyed when they knew that the war was coming to an end and they wanted to hide their secrets. You know, why did Germany have to go and make things so difficult? But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this slightly longer than normal video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!